listening to the best of the Martha Zoller Show. To hear the full show each day, tune in to AM550 and FM102.9 WDUN or log in to accesswdun.com and click the Listen Live button from 9 to 11, Monday through Friday. Randy Davidson is here with me today. And, um, you know, you never know what we're going to talk about here on the Martha Zoller Show, Randy. I didn't know we'd be talking about turkey harvesting. (laughs) I know. It's so great. But we're in that place, aren't we, where we are in this sprint between now and I think King Day. Do you know what I mean? Where it's just going to be a blur as far as what's happening. But Randy Davidson is with Georgia Entertainment News, and we've had him on on a regular basis. But I just said there is so much information about the business side of what the entertainment industry has brought to Georgia, that we wanted to come in and do an extended interview with you about that. So welcome. Thank you for having me, Martha. I've always enjoyed it, but it's it's a different experience being right in front of you. You know, oh. so I'm very very happy to not be on the phone today and to be in the in the studio. Thank you very much. So tell us a little bit. Just bring us up to date on where you are on traveling around the state, and then what when you're going to announce your 2024 calendar. Yeah. So so we. This year, as you know, and you've well documented, we've been very, very aggressive with our um, activities in terms of events. Uh, one of the one of the prevailing reasons was that the um, the legislature was reviewing the film credit this year, which we feel like is a is a big part of the driver of the creative economy, music, gaming, and everything else. That's our belief, and and um, and so what we did is decide to set up a road show around the state. So we've been. To a Saturday morning, we'll be in Savannah um, as our eighth stop, and we and then our ninth stop in this series will be in Valdosta in January. We had to postpone that one because of the hurricane that happened in September, but we've been very active. I mean, we we've had you know 150 to 200 people at locations like Warner Robins, Rome, Georgia, um, and Savannah's already packed out. So. The messaging is very good. And then, of course, we end the year. We talked about, uh, as we were coming on, um, the December 14th gala, the Georgia Entertainment 100, which is an invite-only event um, uh, in Atlanta. And it's where the who's who of this industry sort of come together and talk about the things that we're going to talk about today, which is the real business and career opportunities uh, and growth within the creative economy in Georgia. And I got onto um, some people's radar related to this issue when I was appearing on Political Breakfast a number of months ago when they were reviewing the tax credit. And I made the statement that, you know, yeah, you're going to have uh, a lot of people that are, are focused on maybe what a couple of actors might say about Georgia and some of the social issues in Georgia. But that the fact of the matter is the actor, actors are about 1% of the business and that the rest of the business is controlled by profit and loss and accountants. And those are the people that are going to make the decisions so that these businesses are not going anywhere. And I got a lot of response, both negative and positive. But the biggest one is I had the president of Tyler Perry Studios reach out to me and say, you know what, Martha, you were right. We'd like to show you what we do. And he brought me out to Tyler Perry Studios and showed me the extensive businesses, not just the sets, but the businesses that are happening there. So talk to us a little bit about the businesses that are here because the entertainment business is here. Well, and, and that's and the timing is right. I'm glad that that Steve brought you out there to Tyler Perry. We, Jeslyn and I, my my right hand partner, um, uh, who you you will meet soon as well. But we went to an hour meeting at Tyler Perry recently, and it turned into a three hour meeting. And we're seeing uh, the replica of the White House. We're seeing people uh, working. I saw that. Yes. It was great. We're seeing people working on sets and things. And and you know what? I I, I do agree totally, and that, that that's very good that someone in your position is talking to other people that aren't inside the industry about what's really happening on the business side. Um, these are Georgian jo- th- these are Georgia jobs that are being created. These are people that have their careers. And some, you know, the highlight of this year was the strike in the film industry, um, where folks had to, you know, look for other part time jobs or hustle here, or hustle there to keep afloat until the strike ended. Um, so it, it's 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 a wide swath. It's professional. It's uh, trade jobs, uh, lumber jobs. There's people uh, out there uh, selling lumber specifically for set building and so forth like that. Um, electricians, um, lawyers, accountants, 
catering, hospitality. This year, an entertainment tourism alliance was stood up just for hospitality businesses to be able to better receive and understand what happens when a music production or esports event comes in or a film production comes in. So a whole coalition was stood up for that. And then you've got things happening around the state where communities are coming together to stand up because they see the benefit of the economic impact of, of, of a state backing production in their state. They see it. And other smart people in other states see it because they're all calling us, figuring out what we're doing right and trying to copy it. Texas, Oklahoma, California is trying to get their act together. It may be a little late for them to progress in some areas, but this is a serious situation. The creative economy is taking over and will be the next, uh, it will be the biggest impact of the fourth industrial revolution. Technology has decimated um, the barriers of entry, and it is something that is involved in every part of the academia and curriculum that we were talking about on the phone before regarding career opportun- opportunities. Well, I know, and in my position as the state in the State Board of Education is that we have added uh, you know uh, what we call CTAE, which are which are career paths for entertainment careers, but also for some of the careers you're talking about, construction, electricians, you know that kind of thing. We're even starting construction. Uh, we're introducing construction careers in elementary school, and we're tying it into the math standards so that a kid will start thinking about that before they have to make a decision about a career. You know, my, I tell, I've talked to you before about my nephew, Josh, who, I mean, he has a, a master's degree in industrial design. He is a jewelry maker. He's a very creative guy. But while he was doing all of that, he was building sets at Turner Broadcasting. Okay, and he got to the point where he was so far along with that, he left it for a while, found what he thought was his perfect job, but where he could create things the way he wanted to. But then a buddy of his called and said, Josh, we got so much work. We need you to lead up a team. And so now he's heading up a team and his expertise, even though he still builds sets and all of that, but his expertise is in all these CGI sets where you have to build these styrofoam things to go with the thing. I mean, it's really... (laughs) amazing when you think about it and that was a career that wasn't there 10 years ago absolutely this is something that i think is very important to understand and uh, and and it's something that i'm even more you know understanding even though i eat breathe and sleep this on a daily basis you know career opportunities are a product of your environment so if you're a cowboy out west you know your career opportunity is to farm uh cattle or work as a work at the general trade store you know um In my generation, the career opportunities were, you know, in in the mainstream of blue collar or straight white collar. There was nothing in between. That was the product of our environment. In fact, if I wanted to knit or if I wanted to do something that was artsy or creative, you know, it it would have been shut down by my father. You know, like (laughs) that's not a career opportunity. You You need a real job. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, you can do that when you're sleeping, but you cannot work on that as as a career. Today, I can I can watch knitting. Uh, shows till the cows come home. I can be an influencer. I can make money. I can use entertainment to drive that business. And today, our children are, are their careers that they want is a product of their environment. They're being raised up and brought around by entertainment. How entertainment is involved in almost every transaction that takes place. We're talking and focusing today on. Uh, the Georgia Entertainment Complex, you know, and all of the things that happened. Randy Davis in this year with me from Georgia Entertainment News. And we posed this question before the break. The workforce has changed. On the one hand, you get this message, there's three jobs for every one person. Nobody wants to work. On the other hand, when I mentor um, uh, students, they say, I can't get to the jobs. I try to apply and the algorithms don't fit with me. So how does the entertainment industry um, kind of meet young workers where they are? So that's a great question, Martha. I believe that what was happening, what's really interesting about all of this convergence, there's so many areas of convergence, but, um, you know, when the pandemic started, the remote work trends were already taking place. I mean, people did not want to go into the office. Companies were looking to get better productivity and figure out uh, things then. Then the pandemic just accelerated a trend that was already happening. And look at us today. I mean, the young folks today, they want flexibility. They want 
Um, you know, I had a friend that said that, that, that was interviewing a very qualified person and the person just told him, said, I want to work eight months a year, four months, I'm going to Puerto Rico, take it or leave it, you know? So, so, you know, the flexibility and the different, uh, the differences of today's workforce and tomorrow's workforce for sure are, are going to change the way, you know, businesses are able to hire and retain workers. But in the entertainment space, that's already been there. I mean, these, th- there's a lot of micro businesses, entrepreneurs, even if they're grouped up with a production company, um, they understand the ups and downs of business and how things go, but remote work trends just play into it. In fact, that's, it's one of the ways that I feel like Georgia's creative economy, film and so forth is, is able to spread out even beyond Atlanta to impact Gainesville and Columbus and Valdosta and other communities. So definitely, definitely think that it's a great trend. It's something we can't stop. It's something that we have to just embrace and figure out how to stand up. So if you're a parent out there listening today or a grandparent out there listening today and you've got young people in your family that are maybe in still in school, not deciding, how do you foster that? How do you, you know, encourage that? Uh, that side of that child. Well, I tell you what. I mean, I, we were just in Rome, and we had our Rome unscripted show, uh, a, a, a road show there, and there was a young lady, uh, a Latino young lady, that that was really emotional um, in her discussions about her parents w- would discourage her from tapping into the creative side of her brain and doing things related to film and music was her passion. And they just beat that out and said, you know, you've got to go get a degree. She fought against it, and she's staying in this, and she's moving forward. So my my message to, to parents, and, and I'm a parent, I've got four children, is to not suppress like maybe my father did. And I love him to death, but, you know, he's looking out for my, for my own good. But you've got to let those creative, uh, let, let these people, let your children and the young folks, let them go forth and let that be uh, explosive in their brain. Let them look for opportunities because there is a business opportunity now. I mean, there wasn't a business opportunity for entertainment or it was a very narrow one controlled by a power center, not in Georgia at at my age, but there was no way I could go into uh, music or or acting or story writing. But today, stories will be told by businesses. They will be doing TikToks and developing relationships with their consumers, the plumber down the street, the tradesman. It's an entertainment economy. It's a creative economy. And this right now we see, you know, shimmers of it. It's growing clearly and everything. But I'm I'm, I'm an evangelist. It's really going to take us over. Well, you know, it's funny you talk about how things have changed because my father was a really creative guy. But, of course, his father said no. I mean, you know, exactly. no, you've got to help in the family business. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. And then I was a very creative uh and my parents were very supportive of it, though. I just it was more me and my oh, am I going to be secure enough in this in this world? And it was just more the way my brain was wired. So what I used to tell to my son, who was is very creative, I said, "Look, honey, if there weren't people like me, there wouldn't be people to buy tickets to watch someone like you." Okay, because if we all were as good as he was, nobody would want to watch it. Okay, so so that's why the whole creative economy goes throughout everything, right? And I'll never forget the time my daughter, uh, she was in uh, Into the Woods, and she played the character the witch that became the beautiful girl at the end, and she, they had this long uh, kind of monologue you had to do. And it was the first time that her brothers, which were very, you know, uh, left brain, you know, or right brain kind of people, saw that kind of creativity and they just gathered around her to tell her how great she was. <laughs> and, you know, you have to have that kind of development, but also you do have to talk about your kids in the real world. So how is the entertainment business kind of meshing with the real world? Because people forget, they think entertainment, but they forget business. Absolutely. So, so Martha, it really goes back to, you know, the educational process of, of, of educating our kids. And, you know, one of the thing, one of the initiatives that we're working on that we, we really haven't announced or even talked about is working with figuring out how to um, survey our young folks and figure out their true interest in these creative industries and these and the creative economy, their creative bents in arts, music, films, acting, uh, whatever those may be. 
because the surveys, the the career surveys that are that our children are taking are still the same ones that I was taking. Do you want to go to the military? Do you want to be a lawyer? Do you want to do this? And so curriculum is drafted and set up for tech schools, for colleges, for uh, secondary educations based on data that's not really as relevant as it used to be. So one of the initiatives that we're trying to, uh, that we're working on at the moment is figuring out a way to better explain through data, you know, not through re- my gut feeling or, or some other body, some, someone else's passion, but showing the data that these are jobs that our children want. These are the jobs of the future. And I think that that's the way you bring that, bring that in and those, and you, you make them better prepared to go into what the business of entertainment really is about. Well, and we've got programs through high school. We've got the Georgia Film Academy. We've got music business programs. And in the next segment, we're going to talk more about the music business because people, it's been here a long time. I mean, it's been a part of what we do for a long time. But there's music business programs at places like the University of Georgia and Kennesaw and that kind of thing where you can mesh the whole thing. There's a way to have it both ways. It it is. There's a way to make your parents happy. And be able to follow your entertainment dreams. It, it is, but it's still it's still relegated as an arts path, you know, sort of a not a money making path. It's got this stigma, you know, that has got to go away, and it needs to be a mainstream, or it needs to be incorporated into the mainstream. So one of the, one of the things that we talk about is white collar, blue collar creative collar in the middle. So, you know, you've got this lane of education, this lane of support that that flows on both sides of blue collar and white collar through the creative through creative education, learning, teaching and so forth. But it's still sort of right now unfortunately treated as a startup, but I'll tell you one thing, Georgia's way ahead of everybody else. And I would hate to be in another state trying to figure out what we were going to do to keep Texans in Texas or, you know, New Yorkers in New York. Georgia has it right here in front of us. You know, because Georgia, let's be honest here. We got everything here. We got beaches. We got mountains. We've got flatlands. We got everything in between. I guess desert is the only thing we don't have. And uh, we can do it all here. Randy Davidson is here. But before the movies was the music business. Tell us about the music business today in Georgia. Well, for, first, yeah, you, you mentioned Jimmy Carter, and I, I would be remiss to not um, mention that, you know, this is 50 years of the film office that Governor Carter created, you know, and so next year um, we're, there's going to be a celebration and acknowledgement of that um, um, in the early, early in 2024, and I'm looking forward to that. Lee Thomas's office and the Georgia Film Office and uh, Pat Wilson um, have been very supportive of film and Music, that's the music office and, and gaming and they're, you know, behind the creative economy. And music is a very important part of Georgia. It's older than that, as you said. And Georgia has so much heritage. And it's, and it's one of those things that everyone's, you know, talks about is how do we expand film outside of Atlanta and so forth. Well, the entertainment industry and the creative economy is already outside of Atlanta. Um, great music is being produced. Luke Bryan from Albany, um, uh, Savannah has great talent. Um, down in St. Mary's, there's great talent. So it, it's it's all over. One of the things that that I feel like, you you know, because of the film credit, it gets a lot of attention in the room. You know, in the, in terms of state support and legislative support and so forth. Um, but it is part of the film industry. There's a massive convergence of of music. I mean, sound, audio engineers. There's great career opportunities in those. And those are jobs, whereas Texas is trying to get this, what we have in film from us, we're trying, I feel like we're trying to recruit Nashville, recruit and not have our people leave and go to Nashville for music and audio careers and, and so forth. So there's a lot of opportunity in music. So I love that you mentioned Nashville because the way I sort of think about it is Nashville used to be just country music and now they do everything, right? Mm-hmm. Atlanta was known for hip hop. It was known for that whole genre of music. But then you have people start coming here to do that, to kind of merge it all together. So we're seeing those hubs kind of happen. Nashville's a fun town. It's a great place to go. I mean, I think it's got a lot of the opportunities. And and I think that also, even though we want to promote Georgia and all of that, state lines aren't as important as they used to be. Mm -hmm. If people can work in Georgia, they can work in Tennessee. If they can work in Georgia, they can work in Texas. But... And Texas does have a desert, so we got to watch that. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that we are focusing on the right things. So money-wise, what is this industry 
bringing in and what is it costing us? Uh, music anything. Uh, or, or just anything. the whole thing. Um, so what is it bringing in is bringing in billions of dollars, you know, and that's the incentives that we have. I mean, I would love personally to see um, Georgia stand behind as we have with with the production incentive. I would love for them to stand behind other areas of film uh, production here. I would love for them to provide credits uh, and, and support and incentives for tours to start in Georgia where we can use our v- great venues down in Macon and Columbus for, you know, say a touring artist. And I'll use an example, Drake or Beyonce or someone, you know, they would practice their tour for 30 days in one area you know, and spend all that money in that area um, practicing their, their moves and everything, and then they go on and do the tour. Um, I would love... And I think people don't know a lot about that. They, they, they don't, don't know. They think they just, where do they go? So you do have this opportunity to have people come here and spend 30 days. Absolutely. So 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 there, there's a lot of that. I feel So I feel like, you know, I'm not I'm not complaining because I feel like we've, we've definitely, we're in a position to receive this. I feel like 2024 is going to be a big year for educating local leaders, elected leaders, mayors, commissioners, and people like that, um, as well as our elected legislators to say, hey, you know, this is happening. The, the, we can we can achieve more. We're scratching the surface. We're definitely ahead of in a lot of a, a lot of areas, but we certainly have more work to do to support esports, you know, uh, these events that are coming around for gaming and so forth. DreamHack, the night after our December... There are college scholarships for esports now. It, that just a, blows my mind. <laughs> you can play a game and go to college for free, but... You know, the the night of our event on December the 14th in Atlanta that we mentioned earlier, the night after DreamHack starts, that's 40,000 people coming to Georgia for a gaming-themed expo. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a massive, um, it's a massive gathering of, of this segment. So going back to your point, not to, not to get off the point of, of music, I feel like there's a lot of work that we can do. It's going to take resources, um, for, for the Department of Economic Development to, to have, to be able to build upon that, um, to support gaming development, to support digital production, post production and film. There's so many other areas because just look at the success that we've had in drawing four billion dollars the last two years of spending into Georgia just from an incentive that has created you know, we have over 60,000 jobs just credited to the film industry. Look at that example. Look at how it's spreading. There's a new st- sound stage in Athens. There's one going up in Savannah. There's people uh, developing in, in South Georgia, South Georgia Studios. Um, there's St. Mary's development. There's Flat Rock over in Columbus. This is happening. It's taken time, you know, but we have to just think think it through and be smart. We have some great leaders. Many of them have came to our events. You know, in Rome, the re- legislators were there, around there. In Savannah, they'll be there. In Cobb County, they were there. So they're they're listening. They see it. I mean, they're in their communities, and they see what our kids are playing with, the toys. I mean, the, the, the interest that they have, and it's related to, like, wow, I can work in that and play and, and have a career in that in that field. We're talking to Randy Davidson uh, from Georgia Entertainment News, and we're talking about the, the bigger story around the businesses related to entertainment. And look, I'm a fiscal conservative, all right? And I want to get the income tax down to nothing here. We have a unique opportunity in Georgia uh, right now because we have this huge surplus. And I know there are people out there that spent that thing like 10 times, okay? Because that's just what people do. But we have this huge surplus. We have a rainy day fund. We have the ability to do this tax credit. And I think we're in a unique place where we can almost do everything. Now, you never do everything because some of that money needs to go to deepen the Savannah port. Some of that money, I think, should be earmarked to bring the income tax down even more. And you can do that while still preserving the film tax credit. You know, there's we're in this unique position that we are booming as a state. Now, that means someday it's going to slow down. It's that's the way it is, but if we have all these business in places in place, we are less likely to have a bad economic slowdown. I I agree. I mean, you know, we have a 20 billion dollar ish, you know, if you add up everything, the rainy day fund and everything, I a surplus. You know, we're we're in really good shape and I hear the governor speak and and we ran an interview with him recently um that he did down in south georgia where he's still you know he's not 
you know, over the moon about it. I mean, he, he's very reserved, and I feel like he's very responsible with what this is and that we may need, as you said, to to be wary of things that could happen. But, you know, our step one is to convince the legislators that this creative economy is a tidal wave that's coming, coming, coming. And we can be positioned. It, we're in a position financially to be able to support these industries that are the jobs of the future. So our our job at Georgia Entertainment is to continue to educate with our partners, legislators, local leaders, mayors, um, city city managers about what they need to look for and how they can get behind the creatives in their community. Because if they do that, we then have a multi layered economy, Mar- Martha. We have um, we have electric mobility. We have biosciences. We have creative economy. We have agriculture. We have a mutual fund that can withstand inflation, uh, interest rates, uh, you, you know, variations, and other segment killers, you know, like the banking crisis or whatever. We have a multi layered economy. Other states have two or three industries. That's why they're calling Georgia. That's why they're calling our, our, our Department of Revenue, figuring out, hey, how did you guys do that? How, did, how, are y'all, how are y'all investing in the creative economy? They're calling Georgia Film Academy. Hey, how did y'all set that up all over the state to provide jobs for Georgians? They all want it. And that's, what, that's, that's why I feel like you know, we should be on the forefront of embracing it as an industry and then sharing that to our legislators and our, and our, our leaders in the state. And, you know, and it's a good point you made about a mutual fund. I know you use that as a term to just show it was different economies, but I think that's absolutely right that you've got you've got a cross section of things that are there. And the only thing Atlanta's really missing is a a big financial services company being based out of Atlanta. Ameris Bank is based out of Atlanta, but as far as a big financial service company, that's the only thing that the that the Georgia economy doesn't have. And I it's it's because of bank mergers and all of the things that have happened over the last 20 years. But you look at I, I'm looking at the Georgia economy not being unlike what the North Carolina economy used to be with the research triangle and all the other things that are around. They've had some issues, too, but we are more posi- positioned for the growth. And we cannot deny the fact that we are such a transportation hub as being a part of the reason why all this works so well. Because from the from the beginning of time, Atlanta has been like a crossroads of being able to get places. And now with the Savannah Port there, too, we have an explosion in the ability to be able to transport things. Absolutely. I mean, we, we have we, – and, 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 and you mentioned, you know, needing a major financial services company. And I know you know this, and I'm no fintech uh, expert, but you know we are the leader in fintech. You know, we do more transactions in Georgia. We control nearly, I don't know, some – I'll, I'll have to tell you later, but there's some major uh, lopsided percentage that comes through Georgia of all digital transactions that are that occur. Thankfully, I think it's because of of the investments made, you know, during the Olympics to have the high speed cabling and wiring um, and so forth uh, that that has allowed that and built that. But don't quote me on any of that. But I think we're doing solidly in fintech. But the ports are important, agriculture, and as you said, I really do think it's important that the state embrace and our leaders throughout Georgia embrace a uh, diversification of, 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 of economies and using that surplus to push through and to provide jobs that Georgians want for the future. Georgia Entertainment News, you got a little idea from our <laughs> listeners that you've implemented. Tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, we, we, so we always get great feedback whenever we uh, come on here. and We appreciate, again, you know, all, all the times, the opportunities, you, your reach here online and, and locally, of course, too, goes beyond this area. But you had mentioned and one of your readers and uh, others had said, you know, can you create a job board or where can we find great jobs? And so we have launched that. So if you go to georgiaentertainment.com and in uh, in the navigation, there's a jobs link. And weekly, our, our, our partners are posting jobs. And these are jobs like, you know, that, that span the gamut of the jobs that we talked about before, building supplies, people, um, accountants that are doing accounting work for film and music and entertainment, um, production directors and so forth. So it's a variety of jobs. I mean, certainly it's not, we're not claiming to be the, 
the 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 intersection of of all jobs in the creative economy but we we do have a good section and 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 it, it's an it's a testament to our readership too that that the that folks would want to hire out of the audience that's following this industry consistently well people are so frustrated and this is the thing i talked to chris clark about it when he he came in and did a segment like this with us about job development i talked to everybody who will listen that i don't believe that people don't want to work I don't believe that there are three jobs for every one worker because there aren't enough people trying. I think we have created in this desire to be more accessible technology-wise, and I think it helps in some ways, but we've created this thing that people are discouraged from from pursuing jobs. And what I mean by that is they apply online and it actually says, don't call us, don't follow up. Well, I want the person. I hire people. I want the person that's going to call me and follow up. It's not going to take. It's not. I agree. It's not going to take long, though, Martha. I mean, the the labor market is so tight to find these right people. That will change soon. I mean, and it, and it's really it's frustrating in in across all industries that you have that you can't. Um, that it's not like the old days where you can go in and you can show yourself and be there. But our, you know, co- the companies are the ones that have changed, in my opinion. You know, yes, they're the they ones. Have. They're the ones that are trying to automate and depersonalize, depersonalize the hiring process. And you can't do that in order to get qualified people today. Look, we love screens because people watch content on screens, and everybody needs content. And I love that you mentioned it's not just what you might see on Netflix or whatever, but it's content that somebody might have on a business website that has to be produced or made. That's part of this entertainment (laughs) industry. What I tell to people that I mentor is the number one thing you need to know how to do is to write. If you can write a sentence, a paragraph, a page, if you can do that, everybody's got content, whether it's the Hollywood movie studio or it's the Georgia Entertainment website. Absolutely. Everybody's got content and they need writers. Storytelling is the future. It will all be based on storytelling. You think about it when the when the internet came along, you know, everybody had these the the, the, the everybody had a website, they had a blog, they had a you know, they were going to do some videos. They were going to do some writing. Now, some of those turned into ghost towns for these companies, you know, because they, they, they didn't keep it up. But today, people are the, the savvy companies that are thriving are very active there. And they are also personalizing the experience of being in a, of having employees and personalizing the hiring process. They're not depersonalizing it, as we just talked about. So I will tell you one thing I'm encouraged about is that uh, I spoke to an AP government class a couple months ago. And they were sharing, so these are 17, 18, 16-year-olds, that they're trying to find ways to not be so engaged with their screens, to talk more to people one-on-one. And that's what we got to get back to. That's why the storytelling is important. That's why a story, a good story is so engaging. It's because you do want that interaction. Now, I'm... I'm getting ready. I I haven't. I got out of the habit of going to movies and not using my screen during COVID. But I'm starting to get back to movies because I love them, and I can't wait to go see the holdovers, that new Paul Giamatti yes. movie. Yes, I saw. Um, I can't wait to see that because that looks like an old school movie that I will like. Uh, but I think that people are getting back to that, right? They're getting back to getting out there. They are. I mean, it's crazy, you know. I mean, it's it's. Uh, we were at, um, you know, over in Avalon at the at the Regal Cinemas over there, and and there's people. They're back in the movies. They're back in the movie theaters. You know, I still. I, and I. That's one thing that I that I hope continues to hold, and that. Um, you know that that theatrical releases uh, that we can still have that still have those and let them go through tr- through their traditional flow because I love the movie theater and and I think it's something that I hope that yeah it's too quick to. before it gets on a screen <laughs> because you know I, why would I go to the movie if in a month I can watch it you know on my big you know big ass TV in my living room right, you know right. so and and so but I am going to go my husband even thought he liked that movie too so I think we're going to go to the movies maybe not this weekend cuz you know we'll be getting ready for Thanksgiving but uh it's going to be great tell people the website one more time it's georgiaentertainment.com and they can visit us there and they can follow us on Instagram on LinkedIn um Facebook so uh come and join us check out what we have we have an events calendar and join us at our events as well and think about 
entertainment industry jobs for your kids and grandkids. Maybe even for you. It's where North Georgia comes to talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. It's always great to have the folks from No Labels join me. And joining me right now, because they're in Atlanta, is Dr. Benjamin Chavis, uh, who is a new No Labels national co-chair, has all been involved in the civil rights movement and the NAACP throughout his career, and is well known in many circles. Uh, Joe Cunningham is a former congressman and has spoken with us before about the work at No Labels. Uh, I thank both of you gentlemen for being with me today. Thank you so much. We'll start with Dr. Chavis. Tell us yeah. a little bit uh, about why you're in Atlanta today. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm in Atlanta today uh, on behalf of No Labels. I'm very pleased with the progress that we're making in Georgia. Uh, we're getting ballot access in all 50 states plus the District of Columbia uh, to give Americans uh, better and more options for 2024. So we had a good breakfast this morning. Uh, with leaders from uh, throughout the state of Georgia, and uh, uh, Joe and I will be here for the rest of the day, uh, you know, networking, um, uh, making outreach, and uh, telling people that uh, there is um, uh, a way to get uh, more involved in uh, electoral politics and civic participation, and we're looking for a pathway to victory through no labels. So, Dr. Chavis, uh, an old friend of mine is Joe Lowry. Are we belong to sister churches and he yes. would be on the program with me um in fact because we were sister churches i go to gainesville first united methodist he went to cascade united methodist that's Great. how we built the bridge because i was a republican and he was a democrat that's how we built the bridge to be able to that have him on the program yes. so yeah, dr Lau and i worked together many many years yes and, uh, even when he uh, you know became uh, ill I used to go visit him uh, while he was uh, bedridden and have prayer with him and talk about the gains we made in the Civil Rights Movement. Just let me point out that the reason why we got the Civil Rights Bill, the Voting Rights Act, as well as the Fair Housing Act, was all because of bipartisanship. And and the fact that you and Dr. Lyle used to work together, you know, in the United Methodists, we need more of that in America. We need Republicans, Democrats, and independents to agree to work together. Because one of the things he said on the program was, you know, that the Democrats take us for granted and the Republicans just take us. I'm sure you've heard him say that before. And yes. we've got to get to a place like he and I did, like other people do, um, where we start working together again. And I think that's what you're trying to do at No Labels. That's exactly what we're trying to do. And the good news is we've made progress. No Labels is actually 13 years old. And um, several years ago, No Labels helped to start the Problem Solvers Caucus in the Congress of the United States. And uh, Congressman Cunningham was a part of the Problem Solvers Caucus. He's a great member of Congress at that time from uh, the great state of South Carolina. So, uh, you know, Joe and I are here in Atlanta today uh, to um, get people to have a better understanding of what the mission of No Labels is and invite uh Democrats, Republicans, and independents to work together uh, in the framework of no labels here in the great state of Georgia. So, Joe Cunningham, want to bring you into this conversation uh, because there's been a lot of work done since the last time we talked related to getting on the ballot, and and you also had the the development, I guess, of Robert F. Kennedy Jr. going on to the independent side. So he's doing this process too, where he's trying to get on the ballot. Um, tell us about what that process looks like right now and um, what's going to be leading up to the convention you're going to have in April. Yeah, so we're currently on the ballot in uh, 12 states, and we're in play in a number of others. I hope to be on the ballot by uh, the end of the year in uh, almost 20 states. And keep in mind that, um, you know, people may hear this and say, well, Joe, you still got a little ways to go to get the 50 plus D.C. The truth is, Martha, that a lot of states don't even allow you to begin that process until 2024. So we're on pace right now. and We've got a strategy to get on 50 states plus D.C. And we started, you know, about a year and a half ago. So for anybody jumping in as independent or otherwise and then starting to try to get on the ballot, in all states, uh, it's a cumbersome process. It's an expensive one, and it's very, very challenging to get on um, 
uh, every single state. Uh, but again, we're on our way, um, and I'm not sure if other uh, options will be able to have the same amount of success that we've, we've had. And that's because of hard work, but you know, you look at the polling and the data, and I don't need to remind your listeners that America is craving another option right now. They're craving an alternative, and they're, everybody's scratching their heads thinking, oh, my goodness, like we're such an incredible country with you know, hundreds of millions of people, and these are the best options we have right now. Uh, they want another choice, and we're prepared to give it to them. No, I agree with you 100%. That's what I hear over and over and over again. Um, I was at a Republican women's event last night, and, and of course, it was a mixed bag. I mean, there are some of the women who are supporting uh, former President Trump. Some of the women are haven't made their mind up. Some of the women are looking at other candidates. And I think there's a large enough number of people that are looking for another option that makes this a unique time. Obviously, Joe, you guys know, though, what an uphill battle this is, because in American politics, generally, independent candidates aren't very successful. So so I know you're aware of that. But what does the polling tell you about what people want? Well, the polling shows, you know, the majority, uh, heavy majority of Americans do, do not want to see this rematch. And you think about where we are right now, Martha, and in, in time where we got half of Americans identifying as independent. Uh, so I don't think we, you know it's a very, very uh, unique time uh, right now. And you know, I saw something the other day where I think a third of Americans uh, do not want you know they call them you know some group called them double haters, meaning they, they don't like Biden and they don't like Trump. Um, and so we've got a solid base built in already, people who are committed to voting for anyone else other than Trump and Biden. Um, and on top of that, the, the ticket that we will be putting forward, it's going to be top tier. It's going to be marquee level. These, these going to be household names that folks know and that, uh, that have a, a built in base already. Uh, you know, you look back at, you know, the, the only comparable race in recent history or something like this was tried was Ross Perot. Uh, and he was leading in the polls until he dropped out, ended up getting 19% of the vote. But, you know, as we, as we stand here in Georgia right now, Georgia, like most other state, virtually other, other state in the country, you don't have to get over 50% to win all electoral votes in a competitive three-way race. That's the, that's the misnomer. That, that's, you know, that's the point we want to drive home that, in every, almost every single state in our country, with the exception of two, its plurality wins. I mean, the, you know, is the person who gets the most number of votes. So in a competitive three-way race, that can be as low as 35, 34 percent. If you sprinkle in another candidate like Cornell West or Robert Kennedy, that number can go even lower. So, uh, and the number of the numbers that we have in polling and data suggests that we can we can meet that threshold and exceed it. So, Dr. Tavis, one more question. We have certainly um, a lot of of people of color uh, that yes. are looking for another option. Um, my friend Justin Gibney, who runs the AND campaign, um, he represents a group of urban African Americans of faith that have voted Democrat traditionally, but they don't like the messaging on social issues on the Democratic Party, but they don't like the language on social issues on the Republican Party, even though a lot they align more with Republicans on the social issues. So what is happening in communities of color? Because what we're seeing or what I'm seeing is something I've never seen before, where there is an opening for new candidates to win over the votes of those folks of color. Well, thank you. That's a very important question. And I'm pleased to report to you not only in Georgia, but across America, uh, African-American and other communities of color are discerning uh, a path forward. And we all want uh, common sense solutions uh, to the problems that we face. Uh, you know, uh, the two-party system right now operates at the extremes. Extreme right, extreme left are not giving people of color communities what's needed to improve our overall quality of life. So what you're seeing here in Georgia is not just a Georgia phenomenon, it's a national phenomenon. And that's what gives rise to no labels. I think that, um, uh, you know, centrists uh, working at the middle, 
rather than um, given extremes either in policy or language is where presence of color really want. And therefore, I think you're going to see an increased involvement of people of color communities uh, in the No Labels movement. Absolutely. So, Joe Cunningham, if people want to get involved in No Labels or know more about it, how can they do that? You can go online to nolabels.org and sign up there, learn more about uh, Common Sense, which is a uh, book that we put out about 30 different policy ideas and solutions to everyday problems. Um, and you're going to hear more and more about this group and about what we're doing as we continue to secure ballot access and continue to offer Americans another choice because that, that's what this country was built upon, right, the freedom of choice. And we're just exercising that constitutional right to give Americans another option and, and a candidate to vote for as opposed to voting against someone. So go to nolabels.org. You can learn a lot more there. Congressman Joe Cunningham, Dr. Benjamin Chavis, thank you both for being with me today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Putting the talk in news talk. It's the Martha Zoller Show on AM 550 and FM 102.9 WDUN. Alan Dershowitz, one of the greatest uh, attorneys and law professors in this country's history. Uh, he has been with us before, and he wrote this book since October 7th called The War Against the Jews, How to End Hamas Barbarism. Uh, Alan, and I wanted to have you on again when I had Shondell on because you're both lawyers. So I wanted to have you both on. Well, it's a pleasure to be on. Thanks. Um, I, in the preview, you talked about or the person who was on the air talking about pro-Palestinian uh, demonstrations. There hasn't been a single pro-Palestinian demonstration anywhere in the world since October 7th. Not a single one was pro-Palestinian. They're all pro-Hamas. They're anti-Israel. Not a single one calls for a two-state solution. Not a single one is designed to help the plight of the Palestinian people. They are, at core, basically anti-Semitic. They have nothing to do with the ceasefire. Nothing to do with the ceasefire. How do I know that? Because they started before there was any fire to cease. They started on October 8th commending Hamas for raping, murdering, uh, mutilating, burning uh, babies and children. So this has nothing to do with the Palestinian people, the good of the Palestinian people. It's only about the fact that Israel is the nation state of the Jewish people, and they're supported by the big devil, the United States of America. This is Hitler Youth marching in the United States in 2023. They're not wearing swastikas, but they're wearing green headbands instead. And when terrorism comes to this country, and the head of the FBI said it will come to this country, there will be imitative uh, terrorist attacks based on Hamas. These kids, these Harvard kids, will join the terrorists and will try to be blowing up your children's school. And if it's not stopped in Israel, it's coming to a theater near you. So... How did Harvard get here? I mean, you are one of the most it's always famous. Been there. It's, yeah. Tell us about it. It's that. always been there. In the 1930s, it welcomed Nazis. It sent delegations to the University of Heidelberg after it had fired all of its Jews. When I got to Harvard in 1964, I was called the first Jewish Jew to teach at Harvard. They wouldn't allow a Jew to be a president of the university, a dean, a chairman of a department. Uh, Harvard has had bias. Uh, since they had quota systems against Jews. Then they had a golden period where it, it ended, but now it's back. I'm not surprised. I mean, I taught these students. I remember reading about a professor at um, University of Berlin, I think it was, who taught chemistry, and he was always up for the Nobel Prize, and he was brilliant, he was Jewish, and uh, he loved his students. And the end of the story is one of his students a Nazi, marches him into the gas chambers. And, you know, that's the way when I heard about these things. For me, my focus is not on October 7th. I'm not a military person. My focus is on October 8th. What happened when the National Lawyers Guild, a despicable group of hard left uh, lawyers who for years took all their, all their orders from the Soviet Union, but they have branches in every single law school in Georgia and elsewhere, every single law school in the country virtually, as a National Lawyers Guild branch, on the 8th, <clears throat> the day after these massacres were revealed, they were praising Hamas for a justified military action. Did you see yesterday on CNN they had eyewitnesses that women were gang raped, handed from, from terrorist to terrorist, and then shot. One of them had her, a breast cut off. 
and they were thrown around like a like a football. And this is what the National Lawyers Guild, which calls itself a progressive organization, <clears throat> is supporting and praising. So, you know, just you have to go back to the 30s to understand um, what uh, what these motivations are. And don't ever tell me they're kids, they're children. Kids brought Hitler to power at the University of Munich. Kids brought Stalin to power. Kids brought the Ayatollah to power. Kids brought Mussolini to power. So the fact that they're kids just means they're, they're young and evil instead of old and evil. But these are evil people who will not stop when it comes to killing Jews. Jews are always the canary in the mine. They come first, but they're never last. Good morning, Mr. Dershowitz. This is Shondell Summer. I'm an attorney also, as Martha just mentioned. I'm, I'm curious as to knowing that you knew all of this about Harvard before yeah. you were a teacher there. Why would you support that university, teach there, and impart your wisdom to all these students if you felt like that was their bias? Because I tried to change them, and I did. And during the 50 years I was there and a number of other prominent professors were there, Ruth Weiss and others, Larry Summers, we changed the university. Um, it was, you know, a great university in terms of academics, but it always had this kind of anti-Jewish bias. It still does. And uh, <clears throat> we, ha- we have to change it. You can't just let institutions uh, continue. They're influential institutions. They turn out the leaders of the world. I have 10,000 students, including, you know, 10, I think, seven or eight members of the Senate, uh, people who've run for president. I want to have an influence on that. You know, there is, um, when you think about how we got here, because, you know, there's, there is just ridiculous uh, points of view all across this and, and this blaming of the Jews for everything. I never understood it. My, my family, I'm a Christian. My family has always interacted with all kinds of people throughout my life. Yeah. That's just the kind of life that I lived. I never understood it. And I, I went back and did some research. And even as early as the 1880s, when there were Jews coming back to, uh, you know, to Palestine, you know, for lack of a better term, Transjordan, they were coming back. And they were making something of the lands that they took over. There was resentment towards them then by the nomadic Arabs that were in the area. So it seemed like there is this resentment of success because no matter what you throw at the Jewish people, they figure out a way to be successful. Well, I think you put your finger exactly on it. Why are the progressives and the woke so anti, so anti-Jewish, anti-Israel? Because the one thing that Israel stands for, and Jews stand for over the years, is meritocracy. Uh, we have succeeded based on the merits, based on Martin Luther King's dream. I dream someday that my children will be judged not by the color of their skin or by their religion, um, but by the content of their character. And, you know, Jews stand for meritocracy and success. Not, we're not the only group that has that. You know, Asian Americans, there are other Americans, but it flies in the face of the woke, progressive, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion bureaucracy that says that meritocracy is a dirty word, that hard work is a dirty word, that making it <clears throat> on your skills is a dirty word. They want pure identity politics. If you're black, you're in. If you're white, you're out. Look, the Attorney General of New York running against Donald Trump called the Trump administration too male, too pale, and too stale. Too pale? Too pale? Can you imagine somebody running for office who is a black, uh, 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 running against a black uh, person who is a woman and young, saying, you know, too dark, uh, too female, and too young. They'd never get away with it. But with the uh, reverse of um, equality today and with everything being judged, uh, essentially on an identity, you can do and say anything. If you're a member of a privileged minority, if you're one of the people who the diversity, uh, uh, equity, and inclusion people favor, Larry Summers the other day wrote an article on President of Harvard essentially saying that this bureaucracy is part of the problem, that much of the anti-Semitism grows out of this diversity, equity, inclusion, and also ethnic studies courses. Um, if I were... Uh, in a position uh, of running a university, I would not allow a department of black studies, of women's studies, of gay studies, of Jewish studies, of Asian studies. No, I would have a department of studies where you learn how to think. These departments of ethnic studies have become 
rooting centers for particular groups. They have nothing to do with intellectual challenges. For example, this notion of, uh, of uh, critical race theory. There's nothing critical about it. It's blacks are good, whites are bad. That's the thesis of these departments. And, and they're not part of an educational enterprise. They are the problem, not the solution. We're uh, talking to Alan Dershowitz. Shandell, you got one more question? Yes, I do. What do you think about the fact that where Israel is today and the Democratic Party seeming to be somewhat sympathetic to Hamas on some levels and Republicans being more or less Christians who are devoted to the preservation of Israel? Do you think there'll be a shift in Jewish political contributions, votes, attitudes towards the Republican Party as a result of this October 7th? I do, event? I do. And I think that will really manage itself, manifest itself when the Trump era is over. I know a lot of Jews who would love to vote a Republican, but they, they don't have it in their heart to vote for Donald Trump, even though Donald Trump has been very pro-Israel. They just don't like his views on a range of other issues. They don't like him as a person. And so when Trump's in the mix, it's very hard to make an assessment. But I do think that Jews are leaving the Democratic Party. Look, I don't identify myself as a member of the Democratic Party. I can't stand the squad. Um, I don't like many of the people who call themselves uh, Democrats. I have offered to help finance and to campaign for any Republican who runs against any member of the squad. So although, you know, for historically I've been a Democrat, um, I don't identify any longer with my grandfather and my father's party. War Against the Jews, How to End Hamas Barbarism is the new book. is available everywhere. You can find it on his website. But I want to ask you one final question, because you've sure. got a family, you've got children. How are they doing? In I mean, you've been an outspoken person their whole lives, I'm sure. But how is your family doing in light of all the, the attention you're getting right now? Well, they're a little frightened for me. Um, you know, they tell me to stop wearing the button I wear, which says I support Israel, and the tie I wear, which has the Hebrew letters Chai. Um, uh, but they're on my side. Uh, and I have to say one more word about that. Thank God for evangelical Christians and for others and Catholics and, and, some, and some Muslims uh, who support Israel. And damn those Jews like Jewish Boys for Peace, which isn't Jewish really, but which claims that Israel uh, is a an apartheid genocidal country. So I think that Israel and Jews need all the allies we can get. And thankfully, evangelical Christians have been, for the most part, more supportive of Israel than some Jews have been. So um, this is something that uh, I, I care deeply about. I've, I've always been a, a big supporter of um, uh, groups like that. I work very closely with evangelical Christians in support of Israel, and uh, it's 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 an important uh, uh, unity to maintain. Want to thank you for being with us again, and good luck in all your endeavors. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. To hear the full versions of last week's Martha Zoller shows, go to the podcast page at accesswdun.com, and you can follow me on social media at Martha Zoller.